Thank you for joining us for this segment titled Empowering Adult Education Through Data. I am Maria Gutierrez, an administrator with Miami-Dade County Public Schools, and it is my pleasure to be your guide as we navigate through this interesting topic. Our objective is to cover what you need to know to maximize your performance data by exploring key checkpoints along with actions you can take to positively impact your school performance data. Let me ask a simple question. Do you know why you are getting the results that you get? Many education administrators believe that the only way to improve school data is to focus on student performance. Yes, as educators, we must be primarily focused on student performance. However, what existing processes or procedures, or lack thereof, are sabotaging your efforts at moving your school data needle in a positive direction? Let's look at some procedural actions you can take in order to manage and use your data to positively drive measurable results. Contact hours are significant because they impact student retention and performance. There are two key checkpoints. These are students with 10 instructional contact hours, plus two hours that the state automatically allocates for testing, for a total of 12 contact hours, and students with 60 to 70 contact hours of instruction. First of all, once a student has gained 12 contact hours, this student counts on your measurable skill gains denominator. This means that the student's performance or lack thereof will impact your overall NRS performance. It's also critical that the student be pre-tested within these first 12 contact hours. Ask yourself, what procedures are currently in place to ensure that a student is pre-tested within the first 12 contact hours? The next key checkpoint comes in at 60 to 70 hours of instruction. This is usually the recommended number of instructional hours required by state approved assessments, such as TABE, TAPE Class E, BEST, and CASAS, for measuring the learning gains of a continuous student. Ask yourself what procedures you have in place to post test students at the recommended hours of instruction. Let's take a closer look at what happens when we consistently test students at 60 to 70 hours of instruction. First, we need to be clear that students who have not demonstrated at least 70 to 75% mastery of all tested content should not be tested for the sake of testing. This recommendation is based on the premise that the student is in fact ready for post-testing. In this example, you can see that the student enrolls on January 5th and is post-tested after accumulating 68 instructional hours. Though the student was prepared, the student does not make a measurable skills gain. The student returns to class and now gains 78 hours of instruction before the teacher is confident that the student is ready to post-test. This time, the student post-tests and does make a measurable skills gain. What do we see happening here? The reality is that when you provide students with more than one post-testing opportunity per trimester, two things happen. First, you're increasing the student's chances of gaining an MSG or measurable skills gain. Second, if the student does not make an MSG, you now have more current assessment data to address any remaining learning gaps attached to his functional level. There are two additional points to keep in mind when you're setting up testing procedures to ensure that you maximize all students' opportunities at making that MSG. Instructional hours begin to count immediately after the previous test. This means that you can count instructional hours across trimesters. Next, if your program is set up to be a blended program, be sure to add blended hours to face-to-face -to -face instructional hours for a total number of instructional hours. Let's continue by addressing the significance of calendar days and how these impact student retention and performance you will need to focus on three key figures. 
Six days is significant because if a student has six consecutive absences, meaning the student is absent on six consecutive instructional days, there is a mandatory procedural withdrawal of that student after the six consecutive absence. At this point, you should be asking what procedures you have in place to avoid this mandatory withdrawal. Do you have a system in place where students are contacted at, let's say, the third, fourth, or fifth consecutive absence? Do you collect information on common reasons for student absences? And do you discuss these with your leadership team in order to identify possible solutions? Let's move on to 30 days. If a student is withdrawn and returns to class within 30 days, the student is re-entered in the original course and section number. If the student returns after an absence of more than 30 days, the student is required to be re-enrolled in a different section. The urgency here is to return the student to the classroom as early as possible to restore lost instructional hours. Finally, let's look at the 90-day checkpoint. When a student is withdrawn and re-enrolls in a class and the student has been out for 90 days or more, this initiates a new period of participation or POP for that student. What does this mean and why is it important? This means that any student who returns after 89 days of his withdrawal date will count twice. In other words, the student counts as an additional student. The significance is that every student within a POP must make an MSG per POP. If the student has one POP within a program year, then the student will only be required to make the MSG for that POP. If the student has more than one POP within a program year, the student will need to make an MSG per POP within that year. Let's take a more in-depth look at these periods of participations or POPs. A period of participation is based on participants who are continuously enrolled with a gap of more than 89 days between a course exit and the next course entry. To evaluate for multiple periods of participation, the Bureau of PK-20 Education Reporting and Accessibility, known as PARA, uses the earliest course entry date per term and the latest course exit date per term for the identified student. If 90 days occur between the latest course exit date for the prior term and the earliest course entry date of the subsequent term, a new period of participation would begin. This slide provides an illustration of periods of participation. Notice that for each subject, a new period of participation begins when the student returns after an absence of 90 or more continuous instructional days. Now, to accurately understand MSGs and how they're recorded, you need to clearly understand what these POPs are. Let's look at some key points. A POP begins when a student enters a program and does not end until the student exits the program. A POP is based on participants who are continuously enrolled with a gap of more than 89 days between a course exit and the next course entry. If the student has 12 or more contact hours during this time, the student is identified as a participant within a period of participation. The state will give you 10 hours of instruction plus two hours for testing. A, state, a student is considered to have exited or separated from the program after a period of 90 days without service. A POP may cross program years depending on when the student enters a program and when the student exits the program. Individuals must achieve participant status each time a new POP begins, meaning the student must gain 12 or more contact hours. The key question here is, can a student have more than one POP? The answer is yes. Each time a student separates 90 days without service and re-enters the program with 12 or more contact hours, the student is participating in a new POP. This means that every time the student enters a new POP, the student counts as a new student or an additional student. Let's look at this illustration on periods of participation. 
Notice that this student has three separate POPs with the third one continuing across program years. The first POP begins once the student enrolls and has accumulated a minimum of 12 contact hours. The student then accumulates six consecutive absences and is procedurally withdrawn. The student is out for 90 days and then re-enrolls. Because there were 90 consecutive days between withdrawal and re-entry, the student now has a second pop as soon as the 12 contact hours are achieved. During the second pop, the student is again withdrawn and returns 98 days after his second withdrawal. Again, because it's been more than 89 days since the latest withdrawal date and the new enrollment date, the student now has a third pop. This third pop begins during the same participation year when the student completes 12 additional contact hours. However, it continues on to the next participation year because the student remains enrolled through the end of that second participation year. So why is it so important for you to understand how POPs work? Well, it's easy. POPs can have a considerable impact on your student performance data. Every POP is a new service period and is treated as if the student is a new enrollee. The student is held accountable for an MSG for each and every POP. Before WIOA, you were only held accountable for one educational gain per student for the entire program year. It didn't matter if he attended, stopped, and then re-entered within the same year. Now, a new intake process is required for each period of participation, and you are held accountable for an additional MSG for each subsequent POP. POPs also impact pre and post testing. When we're talking about pre-testing, we have to remember that students must be given at least one assessment to determine the lowest educational functional level, or EFL, during their first 12 contact hours. This initial placement, which is determined by the lowest EFL score of the assessments, is for the entire program year, regardless of the number of POPs a student may have. When talking about post-testing, it's critical to keep in mind that a student is held accountable for an MSG for every POP. There are multiple ways, five to be exact, that students can earn an MSG depending on their program of study. However, post-testing is the most common one. Therefore, students with sufficient hours and progress should be post-tested within every POP. Before we look at a timeline of these critical checkpoints, I want to clarify the term measurable skill gain or MSG. MSG is a WIOA required indicator used to demonstrate participants' progress towards achieving a credential or employment. Although a POP may cross program years, MSGs are evaluated when they occur within a program year for each POP of a participant. So, who is included in the MSG indicator? MSG is reported for all participants, adults who receive 12 or more contact hours within a POP. And who is excluded in the MSG indicator? Participants in correctional education programs who remain incarcerated at program exit are excluded from all performance indicators except the MSG indicator. Participants forced to exit the program due to these extenuating circumstances are excluded. Incarceration or entry into a 24-hour support facility, such as a hospital or treatment center, medical treatment that lasts more than 90 days, being called into active duty in the National Guard or other armed services for at least 90 days, or death. How are MSGs earned? Participants can demonstrate MSG in five ways, depending on their program of study. The category MSG by Educational Functioning Level, or EFL gain, has the first three. One, 
advancing to one or more higher levels of pre and post test EFL gains. Two, earning sufficient Carnegie units, adult high school, to move from low ASC to high ASC. Three, exiting the program and entering post secondary education. Co enrollment in adult education and post secondary does not count unless the student is still enrolled in post secondary after he exits adult education. The second category, MSG by secondary diploma or equivalent, has the last two. Number four, earning an adult high school diploma, and five, earning a high school equivalency or HSE diploma. Let's look at the corresponding visual on the following slide. And here is a visual for an easy at a glance summary of the five types of MSGs under WIOA and how they are earned. Now, we have covered a lot of information so far, so let's review with another easy to follow visual. First, be sure to pre-test a student within the first 12 hours of instruction. Remember, we're talking about 10 hours of instruction plus two hours allocated by the state for testing. The second significant checkpoint comes at 12 hours of instruction. At this point, the student becomes an NRS participant and is now part of your MSG denominator. This means the student is required to demonstrate an MSG. Third, a student is withdrawn after six consecutive absences. Fourth, if a student returns and re-enrolls in a program within 30 days of the initial withdrawal date, the student is re-enrolled within the same course section number. Fifth, if a student returns and re-enrolls in a program after 30 days of his initial withdrawal date, you must re-enroll the student in a different course section number. And finally, what happens when a student is withdrawn from a program and does not return to the program until 90 or more days after the withdrawal date? Well, at this point, the student will initiate a second period of participation or POP and will count yet again on your denominator. This means that the student will need to make an additional MSG for this POP, even if it falls within the same program year. In other words, the student counts twice at this point. As an added note, if the student were to have three POPs within a program year, the student would be required to make an MSG for each POP. Let's continue with best practices you can put into place in order to increase your opportunities at increasing MSGs for your programs. There are several best practices that you can implement to immediately assist you in increasing your MSGs. First, be sure to establish procedures at your site for pretesting all incoming students within their first 12 hours of instruction. Second, prepare your students for post testing. Are you targeting non mastered tested competencies or standards prior to the testing date? Are you providing intense remediation, say 10 to 15 hours prior to assessment? You may definitely want to establish some sort of boot camp program to address any outstanding learning gaps. Also, be sure that students are in fact ready to be post tested. They should have demonstrated anywhere between 70 to 75% mastery of all tested competence. Third, do you test only at the end of the trimester or do you have an ongoing post-testing program? Students who have demonstrated sufficient mastery should be tested every 60 to 70 hours as recommended by the testing company. Also, when a student is provided with more than one opportunity to post-test within a trimester, you are also providing the student with more than one opportunity to make an MSG. Fourth, if a student has been withdrawn from your program and needs to be retested, be sure to re-enroll the student prior to retesting. Fifth, be sure that you post-test any and all students that you know will not be returning to your program. Just ensure that they have accumulated the minimum required number of instructional hours. And finally, 
set yourself a minimum target to ensure that at least 70% of all your students are post-tested within each trimester. Now, some of you may not be aware of where you can locate your MSG data. So we will end this segment by answering the question, where is data reported for measurable skills gains? The NRS has four tables for reporting MSG. Table four for all participants, table 4C for participants in distance learning, and table eight is listed here because it is one of the four tables. However, you do not need to concern yourself with this table, which is why it has been canceled out. And fourth is table 10 for participants in correctional educational programs. Each NRS table breaks down the following by NRS functioning level. The total number of participants, the number and percentage who achieve an MSG, the total number of periods of participation, and the total number of MSGs by period of participation. Now, one final note to remember. Only the most recent MSG achieved is reported per period of participation even if more than one MSG is achieved. And that concludes this segment on empowering adult education through data. I challenge you to apply your new learning as you make data-informed decisions that will move your performance needle in the right direction.